Well, hello and welcome back to the Force Friday show where we discuss all things Star Wars. Today I'm going to be joined by Stephen as ever to discuss a wide variety of various different topics. The headline Stephen knows all about Rogue One writer saying that EA has catastrophically mismanaged the Star Wars games. Now I have to say, as a gamer who purchased the first Star Wars Battlefront of the mm. new era of yeah. Disney owned sort of a Star Wars products and that also they gave EA the rights once again to produce and make all the various different Star Wars games. They had the Star Wars license. Um, I completely agree with his sentiments. I think they've made the, it's been a complete abomination. Um, when you look back, Stephen, to the early 2000s through to the mid 2000s of the prequel era, even the late 90s, mm -hmm. mid 90s, um, the amount of Star Wars games, the amount of great Star Wars games that came out under the Lucasfilm, obviously. Lucas Arts, yeah. Lucas Arts, yeah, yeah. yeah the Lucas Arts. Um, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, but under Lucas Arts anyway. Uh, and then compare it to now. Yeah. We've had this license now for what? Six years? Mm -hmm. Five, six years? And we've only had two um, real yeah, console there's a lot games. Of expansion packs. There's a lot, and stuff yeah, like that. expansion packs. And then you've got the vid, the mobile gaming and stuff like that, which I don't care about. I've no. tried some of them, but they're. A bit snide. No. Uh, but when you look into the amount of console games now compared to yeah. what we had 10, no. 15 years ago, it's an absolute disgrace. Yeah. And even the games we're getting now, Stephen, have been colossally mismanaged. The Battlefront uh, series is, whilst I think <coughs> visually and in terms of actual gameplay and stuff like that, I think it's a, a different level to the ones we had yeah. previously. And I thoroughly enjoy the older ones. Just the addition of. Uh, Loot crates yeah. and all this crap and expansion packs, it's yeah. just, it's I, not on. John, I think that in regards to the Battlefront series, um, yeah. on paper this was a, a match made in heaven mm -hmm. uh, with EA. I, I'm always about to say EU because I keep hearing this with Brexit and all that and I keep hearing the EU. EA. No, we EA. Don't there. Um, we, back in 2010, we were big fans of the Battlefield series. I think mm -hmm. we were um, obsessed with Battlefield 3 at one point. And there was some rumours going about at that point when um, EA were going to step in and, and do a Star Wars version of that type of game. Yeah. And we were like, oh, this will yeah, be we an absolute amazing... Yeah, we were Stephen, and then just the thought of Dice coming in and doing a I, Star Wars and version And enough, John, I loved the Battlefront games that were on the PlayStation yeah. uh, in the early 2000s that we yeah. both had. I think we had both of them. Um, there was the the Force Unleashed as well. You gave me the first uh, Battlefront game, yeah, Stephen, so and I was absolutely obsessed. I played yeah. it day in, day out. I was just so much so yeah. you were dreaming of it. I yeah. was. I was having yeah. bad dreams about Darth Vader chasing me around Bessman. Strangely, in a big sort of a supermarket, I would go yeah. in a door and there'd be lines upon lines of Stormtrooper helmets. And I heard that distinctive breathing sound in it. A lot of Star Wars fans would yeah. love that. No, I don't love it. No, you don't want a six um, foot nine <clears throat> whatever figure chasing you, Stephen. I'm a very small man compared to Darth Vader. But, I don't um, want that. <laughs> we'll go back to what, what we're talking about. <laughs> um, on paper, it sounded great. Um, we both got Battlefront, the, the the one that came out a few years ago. Yeah. And um, I Actually, think you I think you still remember my rage after that <laughs> last game that we played. Um, very prompt. It was I uh, just came off it. I tossed the the game across the room and said I'm never playing that pile you of didn't. you know what ever again yeah. because it was a even. terrible um, scripted game I felt I felt that it was you could see what was going to happen before it happened in the game yeah. it was just unbelievable well, that's classic EA Stephen um, anybody fixed. who's ever played the FIFA yeah. series on EA will realise it doesn't matter how much you try you can't score a goal the point in, in involved in these games yeah. turn up. that's a degree but <clears throat> It's an absolute joke. They've just cancelled another open world franchise yeah. game. I think it's from Vi Vis. I can't remember. <laughs> not not doing very well here for names. But it was. Uh, I think it was the same people who were involved in the. Uh, uh, Jesus Christ, I'm having an absolute mare here. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's a one that fantastic franchise. It's a PlayStation exclusive. Um, and it's an open world franchise with great characters and great stories. It could really be yeah. turned into a film. And in actual fact, I think they were talking about um, making it into a film. Uh, and, They've cancelled this, I think it's Visceral Games. Uh, yeah. They've cancelled this fantastic open world game that was in production and in plans for about two, three years, if not more. Uh, and they've now cancelled it because he says yeah, it would take too one, yeah. long yeah. to come out. They want another game to be in development. I think it's actually in development with EA Canada or something. Yeah. And that will come out in a shorter time span. But what they don't seem to understand EA is that people don't really care about the length of time it takes to develop the game, how long it takes for it to come no. out. 
they want quality and they want games with a good storyline that that's will why add exponentially into the canon. That's why Rockstar are so good at doing what they do because Certainly. they don't just um, you know uh, throw these titles out well, willy nilly. We'll wait four, five, you six look, years. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Then you get the final Definitely product. for the GTA games. Yeah. You're waiting a good six, seven years for each of those games coming out. And look and, what happens. Uh, Red Dead Redemption, the sequel to that, took a long time. Game to, of the year, Stephen. Yeah. So but the problem is that people involved in EA don't actually believe Stephen that the single player games with great storylines uh, are relevant now yeah I don't believe that they don't believe it's relevant they the think it's all Red about Dead Redemption uh, single player game was immense well, I was sort of, I was um, upset you gave me a loan of yeah. it and I don't think I gave it back for about 4 or 5 months because well, I was point, obsessed Steven, with the game that's the point I was making Red Dead Redemption 2 game of the year uh, so it's yeah. a single player game predominantly with a fantastic storyline this is what Star Wars fans want they don't I mean we can have Battlefront games until we're blue in the face that's always got its market. I enjoy a good shooter. Yeah. Uh, and when I first played that Battlefront game, I was blown away with it. I actually got Battlefront 2 on the Game Pass or the, on the EA Game Pass, I think I, it was. I think they've, they've totally, I think they've totally um, missed the point here as in regards to gamers and <laughs> Star Wars fans as well, EA, because I think you're right. Mm -hmm. I think they, they're trying to focus too heavily on the online gaming. Um, yeah. You look at a game like Alien Noir, which didn't yeah, have yeah. any um, Xbox Live or whatever, no. Um, it was a single player game, it was a beautifully made game, mm -hmm. a great storyline as well, kept you interested, it was a detective one wasn't it? Yeah. And um, just a phenomenal game, and that was mm -hmm. for Rockstar as well I think. Yeah. Um, in regards to LucasArts, um, I had some of the best ones that were out there, I had the pod racing one um, from the Phantom Menace. Yeah I had um, that as well. I had Rogue Squadron I think it was called. Yeah. Um, that was uh, Luke Skywalker and his, his squad, you know, um, doing some missions. Mm -hmm. It was a fantastic game for the PC. Game, it's game. Dark Forces was what another one I had. I was one, it was yeah. a very much Doom style game, um, which I thought was another great idea because I loved Doom and I loved Quake, and this was a, a game specifically made for Star Wars fans. Um, looking back on it, the graphics are a bit shocking, but at the time it was an excellent game. It was very interesting, it kept me interested as a Star Wars fan and I wanted to see more. I think LucasArts had more hits than they had misses, so mm -hmm. that decision to disband that division of Lucasfilm really baffled me at the time, John. Um, I don't know, there was I remember obviously... playing the, even the Indiana Jones game, Stephen, when like the Amiga yeah, and stuff like yeah, that, LucasArts, yeah. and it just uh, did a fantastic run yep. of just outstanding games and Knights of the Old Republic 1 and 2. For me, still the two greatest Star Wars games in terms of storytelling and just twists, great game mechanics. And then even the, the likes of, as you said, Rogue Squadron, uh, I have recall playing the Phantom Menace uh, yeah. game on the PlayStation, that was brilliant, it was a top-down yep. one. Um, I recall 90, uh, Nintendo 64 games, uh, the pod racing game. Uh, the original arcade hours hours game made a kind of a comeback in the 1990s yeah. as well on the Sega. It was um, the arcade version, I think it was the... The Death Star Trench, it was very basic graphics, yeah. but it was a big hit in the arcades in the 80s. Um, it had a kind of a um, rebirth in the 1990s mm -hmm. on the Sega platform, I think the Master System, um, and the uh, Mega Drive, I can't remember, the Genesis was that Genesis, called? Maybe, um, yeah. At the time, and it was a fantastic platform. The games they churned out were more, yeah. um, often than not, hits more than misses, and it still baffles me to this day why that was Jedi disbanded, Academy, you know? Jedi Outcast, The yeah. List is Endless, Stephen, fantastic games, all through a 10-year period. Force Unleashed. Force yeah. Unleashed 1 and 2, further enjoyed it again, yeah. great single-player storyline ga uh, games. This is what Star Wars fans want, this is what Star Wars, what Star Wars fans deserve, and EA, I just don't feel other developers to give us that. No, just they're no. Not, they're, they're, their ethos don't marry well with uh, what the Star Wars fans ultimately want, which is a great interconnected canon story with a brilliant... The Man uh, Babies. Yeah, yeah, the Man Babies. With a fantastic open world experience, you know, like GTA. I'd love to see Rockstar coming in and doing a Star Wars game, but sadly it's never going to happen. <laughs> EA has the yeah. sole rights to the licence, and they're just uh, they're incompetent, sadly. Uh, and I'll just get back again, Stephen, finally to the comparison between now and back in the early 2000s. We had a fantastic run of games. Mm -hmm. Look at what we've got now. We've had two games for the consoles. It's totally unacceptable. And there needs to be a change put in place. And the games we've had have been very much uh, focused on extorting yeah. the fans of even more money after they've purchased yeah. the game. Uh, and that's a, a crime, really. That's a, that's, a, that's a sad indictment of uh, gaming, modern yeah. day gaming. It's, it's all about cash yeah. grabbing, almost like child gambling. Yeah. A lot of people are trying to 
It will then in fact be successful. What was the Maybe game uh, John you had on the PC? It was the uh, open world Star Wars game. It was, it was Star Wars Galaxies, yeah. Was it Galaxies? Yeah, yeah and I actually played that. Old Republic as well, the yeah. online game for a yeah. short while. So, yeah. um, I'm not knocking the Battlefront games. I've got the place. I enjoyed them to a degree. As I did say, I trialled Battlefront 2, played the storyline, thought it was okay. Um, but I just wasn't getting into the My whole My copy of Battlefront is still lying in that corner on the house. <laughs> Not moved, not touching it. I've not touched it in a long time, Stephen. I'm not going back to it now, sadly. But look, we'll move on because I'm getting bogged down here. Yeah. By uh, just incessantly repeating myself, it's not going to change, sadly. EA, don't care. So I'll move on to the next topic. It's all about Star Wars actor Richard E. Grant. Stephen describing episode nine's extreme spoiler <laughs> protection measures. We've seen the likes of um, Mark Hamill discuss this. We've seen yeah. uh, a whole host of people really discussing it. Whilst it's a more um, a looser experience on the set itself. They're uh, doing a lot of uh, what the hell do you call it, Stephen? Interior. No, uh, just ad living. All right, okay, yeah. yeah doing yeah. a lot of that, and it's a more looser experience, an enjoyable experience. Yeah. When it comes to security measures, um, we've seen Mark Hamill discuss the script. Mm -hmm. It gets sent over to I think, I think it was Romania or something. I can't recall the exact country, and it had red font, so it was really difficult to read. So we know that JJ is famed for his mystery box. He doesn't let anything out the hat unless he really wants it. Uh, and here we're seeing the now Oscar nominated, finally, Richard E. Grant. Yeah. Discussing it, I've seen Richard's yeah, fantastic reaction to the Oscar nomination. Uh, well pleased for the guy, he's a fantastic actor. Cannot wait to see what yeah. he's going to bring to the Star Wars universe because they better not underuse him. I they better not be I, a bloody Uncar put under a suit. I think uh, a lot of people naturally assume he's going to be part of the First Order because yeah, he's, he's English. Uh, he's English yeah. Yeah. And he has that kind of. Um, Theatrical background as well, you yeah. know, um, which Still is understandable. So, but I wouldn't mind that because I think he'd do a good job of it. Um, mm -hmm. I think he'd be a, a great uh, imperial officer. In I some think fashion. he'd be a great Grand Admiral for on Stephen. But I says that about Benicio yeah. del Toro, and I says that just mm -hmm. near endlessly about every single actor that could possibly have stepped in and played the role. He's got the hair for it, make him blue. Yeah, but not white. Caucasian skin and then no. rubbing it off and looking blue. No, definitely not. <laughs> I'm not going there, John. I know what you're referring to there, but um, <laughs> I'm glad you're dead. I'm glad um, you're dead. But yeah. listen, um, this must be a new experience for this actor. Um, yeah. he's, he's, you know, he's an accomplished actor. He has mm -hmm. been for the last 30, 40 years now. Um, this experience must be new to him, though. Mm -hmm. The whole uh, the secrecy act, they've got to sign yeah. things, they've got to make sure they keep their mouth shut. They've NDAs probably drip fed a lot of the information and script, as you said. Oh, he says that. Um, yeah. The whole the uh, undercover thing because of all the drones that are taking snapshots of uh, yeah. Pinewood. Um, it must be a, a bizarre experience for an actor to come into that's not used to that. The likes yeah, of, uh, yeah. Even the new ones, uh, that, you know, the likes of John Boyega. Daisy Ridley, um, Oscar Isaac, um, they'll be used to that now. Um, you know, this is five years down the line for mm. them. They'll be well versed in how to to act and behave. Um, I don't think Tom Holland's going to get any calls mm -hmm. for a Star Wars film anytime soon because that boy can't keep his mouth shut. But someone like Richard E. Grant, he's an accomplished actor, very mature actor. He knows the the script, uh, but maybe he doesn't know the script. But he knows the script in regards to his protocol yeah. uh, on uh, and off camera in regards to Star Wars films. Um, I'll tell you something, John. Um, mm -hmm. We're just approaching. We're not long off February now, and there's not a lot came out about Episode Nine yet, isn't there? Not? No, I think there's going to be an explosion very shortly. I think so, and I think it's going to start with the title, but. Um, yeah. This so. just reminds me how much J.J. Um, Abrams is so good at keeping, um, you know, uh, plot details and, and photographs and stuff like that. Um, you know, just keeping it all under the lid, as you said, the, you know, that, that box he keeps for, um, he, he lifts the lid when it suits him mm -hmm. and at the right time as well. Uh, Ryan Johnson, to, to his credit as well, was a very this very much the same. He didn't reveal... Uh, a whole host of things. We got some um, behind the scenes well, shots you say and that. stuff like that. But you say that, Stephen. But when you actually look back at the trailers for the last Jedi, he's telling you right there. And then this is what's happening: the yeah, Jedi but, must die. They kill yeah. the past. The past must die. Kill it if you have to. Oh, but, forget but, the past. But we're all living in an age where people. The first thing they'll say is this a misdirection. Yeah. 
that's messing with people, you yeah. know. Um, because JJ Abrams did that in the Force Awakens mm -hmm. as well, uh, with some of the trailers, and uh, Ryan Johnson carried that on. But I'm glad to see JJ Abrams is back in the director chair. Yeah. Um, he knows how to handle, um, uh, you know, the storyline. He knows how to handle the secrecy. That's the most how important to thing. Inject the feel of Star Wars. I know idea. that. I know that. Um, I think it was maybe a few days in the run-up. We did our best to keep off social media etc um, until we've seen the film but I know that you went down a bit of a rabbit hole Is that with The Last Jedi yeah. yeah, and it kind of ruined your experience yeah, no, and, well, I can, well, and I can understand that yeah. to an extent where I'm, I don't mean you're, you're not happy with what yeah. you've seen but I mean the experience of seeing it yeah. on, the, on the screen um, for the first time without knowing what's going to happen mm -hmm. that experience is ruined yeah it ruined, the, yeah. It ruined the, the Snoke death scene more than anything Stephen yeah. but in a way I was relieved that I found out that look also met an untimely end at the end of the film because um, if I went into the cinema and watched that first hand with no prior knowledge I you think you have prepared prob yourself for it yeah I think somebody would have maybe have died near yeah. by me but when I finally get that disappointment out of my system and went to finally see the film a day or two later uh, I'd keep the terms with it and I could process it and say well, well that's his artistic direction that's what he's chosen for play him Stoke was probably the most disappointing though in that regard Seeing him being unknown that he'd been scythed into, that was quite disappointing because that took the shock out of that. Uh, and that was sad because it was a fantastic moment. But what Stephen does, he says it's extraordinary. They don't give you a script. Uh, you have to go to a room where bodyguards are outside. Closed, closed circuit TV, television cameras. It's printed on uh, crimson pages. I said crimson font. It's actually crimson pages. You can't crimson photograph tight. it. You, it's very difficult to read. Uh, and he just says it's an incredibly tight operation they're running here. Uh, and I find that... In, Incredibly interesting, just again hearing about the processes of uh, what JJ goes through yeah. for these films, what he puts his actors through. They must have some memory, because yeah. if I have to go to this room and read this script, um, I'd probably forget half of it. I'd have to keep going back and uh, forth, like uh, a man drunk uh, going to the toilet. It's one of the things that I'm going to miss about the Star Wars films, because mm -hmm. I, I still believe that after this one, we're not going to get a Star Wars film for maybe a couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be very interesting to see how they handle the show's going to die, Steve. their whole secrecy act. No, the Mandalorian, and that'll keep us going. Um, that's <laughs> what I was going to talk about. How they're going to handle a television series yeah. and the secrets. I don't know how guarded the Game of Thrones uh, plot is. Is that is that the same, John? Do, do they I think keep the that? script's guarded, Stephen, yeah. but they tend to the episodes tend to leak yeah. online mm. like a month before the actual yeah. series drops. I don't partake in that nonsense. No. I like to watch it and experience it the way it's meant to be consumed on the TV. I'd like to consume it in a cinema, but that's not going to happen. They've got no. with that idea, sadly not. It'd be interesting, but it's because it's television, to be fair. Yeah, but uh, Stephen, it's just fantastic seeing the processes uh, of behind the scenes of a big mockbuster like this. We've seen little tidbits. We've obviously seen um, Kevin Smith get in and telling us it's like a, almost like a country, the size yeah. of the operation, the scale of it. And that JJ's the right man for the job, he believes in his mind. Um, it's just it's a fantastically talented director like what he's doing is just great we're seeing the experiences of the actors if I did, as I did touch upon at the beginning of the topic they find that a much looser and enjoyable experience in spite of having to go into these uh, rooms and read scripts off of Crimson Pages and whatnot. but it's just great again to see a guy of this experience of this calibre who's been in the industry for so long um, be faced with a, a new experience yeah. Yeah. in the film industry yeah. uh, and joining in a Star Wars film and having to put up with all that crap of the secrecy but it's a necessary evil but I digress Stephen I've given on quite long enough I'm not adding any more to the topic I'm going to move right on to the next topic okay. this one may be a little bit shorter because um, I think we're both pretty much yep. in agreement <clears throat> that this is a load of crap um, it's incredible Luke and Darth Vader moment you may have missed in the return of the Jedi and this is basically some chap from I presume probably Reddit or something again um, re-watching the, the return of the Jedi for probably about the 50 millionth time and he's watching the throne room mm -hmm. uh, which is the best part of the film for me I think you'd agree with me on that yeah, one of yeah. the best extended sequences in any of the Star Wars films but it's a moment where Luke turns around and ignites the lightsaber he said quite enough of old chiefs um, <laughs> mind games and try to get him to strike him down uh, and he turns around and ignites the lightsaber and of course Darth Julius Vader as a certain Mark Ellis likes to call him <laughs> ignites his lightsaber and extends it out and blocks the, the, the shot or the swipe down at the Emperor. And what this guy's saying is, is this perhaps the Darth Vader trying to protect his son from going down that dark, tumultuous path no into the dark side? Well, I for one think it's another lot of nonsense. 
Yeah. I think Duff was very bit Duff. I'm doing my Ben Kenobi again here, Stephen. Yeah. I think Vader it was very, or Anakin. Was he Anakin at that point? No, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. I think he was blocking the Emperor yeah. uh, from being killed. Because we see thereafter he pursues Luke underneath. Yeah. Luke ends up scurrying underneath the, the walkway. And then he says, Sister, you have a twin sister. If, she, if you won't turn, then perhaps yeah. she will. Exactly. If he was blocking Vader, um, the Emperor to protect his son's. Um, mindset and getting into the dark side that, and whatnot. He wouldn't be that, trying to turn his sister. That whole sequence, John, um, is some of the best Star yeah. Wars uh, scenes you'll see in any of the films, <laughs> regardless of what you think of Return of the Jedi. I love it. Um, but um, Vader's turn back to Anakin was at the very last minute. Yeah. There was conflict in him. Yeah. I'm not de denying oh, yeah. that. Look, does say throughout the the last sort of. Um, no, 45 minutes yeah, yeah you get to see those um, scenes going back and forth between Endor and and, and them and the conflict is there yeah. but the turn doesn't happen until um, you know looks on the floor dying yeah, that's when it turns completely render that useless yes exactly <laughs> I was just you took the words out of my mouth yes He's exactly by the, the, so the force lightning and, and I'm pretty sure that Palpatine would have sensed yeah you know, if he was blocking him for that intention, he would have turned around to him and said something like, what are you playing at, you know? Well, we've seen it. I've, well, I've read it, Stephen, yeah. in the Lords of the Sith book, um, that, which is part of the canon. Yep. That almost, what would you call it, fencing, uh, parrying between the mm -hmm. two, parley, I don't know what the hell you'd call it, Stephen, um, where Vader gets a bit big for his boots and starts think my thoughts to maybe overthrow the Emperor and then the Emperor senses yeah. it and says no it's not going to happen we saw, that in the last, we saw that in the last Jedi yeah. with Snoke even someone like Snoke who I don't regard as, um, as more powerful than Palpatine no. Snoke could sense um, every emotion yeah. every movement and Ben Solo I was about to say Ben Kenobi there and Ben Solo um, and it was emphasised heavily in the last Jedi and even right up to that last moment uh, when uh, Ben you know, flicks yeah, on the lightsaber. from Snoke. Yeah. He senses everything in that room, mm -hmm. and Palpatine would have, his senses would have been more heightened than, than yeah, Snoke's. He would have known him. Vader yeah. um, was blocking him to defend him. Yeah. There's no chance he would have thought, you're doing no. that to save your son. No, no chance, absolutely no chance. No, I completely agree with you, Stephen, and as you did say, completely render Luke's <laughs> electrocution yeah. meaningless. Um, it's just a sadist. Yep. And there's no conflict within him at all. He's an absolute, I shall say this, he's letting his son get electrocuted down in the floor when he's already blocked him. Yeah. So he's going to block him from uh, turning to the dark side by a fire a sweet to the Emperor. But he wants dead anyway, apparently. Um, but so what you this know, guy, his son to be tortured. So what this guy's saying is, um, it could have been, Vader is blocking uh, the, the, light, the lightsaber, striking Palpatine to protect his son. But then, five minutes later, <laughs> yeah, be he's... Goading them to come out of that dark staircase. Exactly. I'm, if I can't get you, I'll get your sister. And why would they allow his hand to Give the yourself to the dark side. And, yeah, and, and Stephen, on. the final thing I will add on this, which should put an end to this nonsense, is that if he's protecting him from going to the dark side, why would he then, as you say, goad his son into a full on rage with his yeah. swiping furiously at him? Yeah. Which I thoroughly enjoyed, yeah, incidentally. That was, good, yeah. was great. The music and everything that scene was amazing. Yeah, I was, was about to say the music, utterly yeah. outstanding, goosebumps. Um, it makes no sense. It's utter nonsense, <coughs> and I'm going to move on on that note, Stephen, because it's just <laughs> to the next topic. Bantha George Pudu. Lucas explained Mantha Pudu, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm not going into Sawalba. Um, I love the guy's pod racer, but and that's the end of it. But look, Stephen, final topic of this week's Force Friday show is all about George Lucas explaining why Chewbacca didn't get a bloody medal in 1977. Apparently, he'd done this already all the way back in 1977. But people didn't pay attention to it clearly. And uh, basically, what he said is that Chewbacca didn't take a medal because he didn't place much importance in being given a shiny little medal by some princess who was calling him a walking carpet no later than an hour previously. Yeah. Um, they had their own process, they had their own traditions and ceremonies, and that the gang all went life to. Day. Yeah, they had a life day. But the gang all went to Kashyyyk and celebrated with all of the Wookiees and uh, it was a very special moment for not just Chewbacca himself but the entire Wookiee race so that's why he didn't get a medal that should shut up all those butthurt little gits out there who whined incessantly about Chewbacca being left out what about C3PO, what well, about r 2 It does make a good point in the article John that um, Carrie Fisher couldn't reach up to Well Steve, that's so the more practical yeah. reason why I mean Carrie Fisher was about 5 foot 1 
Peter Mayhew is about seven foot two. Yeah. How in the hell is she going to put a medal? You'd have to bend down, lie down on the floor for it. Or pick put, it up. Yeah, I'll pick mm. it up, put her tiny little hands around his neck <laughs> and give him a medal. It's just, that's a practical reason. Yeah. Uh, but here is now the canny. Can, canon odd, I can't say it, canon reason, I was about to say canonical, I think that's the right term, but that's the reason now Stephen, it's been explained by the man himself, the main man, the maker, the creator, George Lucas, so there we go, what do you make of that? Um, Are you shocked? Are you well, stunned? I'd asked you the question before we came on an air, John, um, <laughs> would your dog Harley be interested in a medal? No, he'd try to eat it. No. I'm not. I'm not saying that Chewbacca is a uh, hands no, pet in, uh, in regards to that or anything. Oh, but he's but like a dog. I think he's got different. Um, he's got different perspectives in life. I think that's what Lucas is trying to say. Yeah. You know, he's um, he's got his own traditions. Certainly, I don't think the medal would have meant much to Han. I think he would have sold that um, yeah. within a few days after he got have it. Melted it down and turned it into yeah. dice. But sadly, that's been thrown I don't know now. what Luke would have done with his. I think Luke would have thoroughly enjoyed having that medal, yeah. certainly when it came from his sister, because he had a bit of a thing for his sister at that point. Because, yeah. of course, in canon, I wish she wasn't that jacket, his though. sister. That jacket, yeah, yeah, Luke always had great jackets throughout yeah. all of the original trilogy. My personal favourite was the little boy number. I'm pretty, no, was it a boy number? No, it wasn't. No, the, the little beige number on Cloud City. Empire before Strikes he back, gets yeah. humbled by his father. I quite like Hans in uh, Force Awakens. Han is the ultimate, Stephen, in it's, terms uh, of jacket wearing like Parker, in Star Wars. Han is without yeah. the shadow of a doubt the greatest jacket wearer in the entire trilogy. And that's because of Harrison Ford. Perfect, perfect height, perfect shape. Yeah. Six foot one, big muscular guy, never yeah. lost it. All of these parkers. I don't are think tremendous. he cared for medals, though, John. But I no. think I think Lucas sees explanation whether or not he said this back in 1977. I am. Um, I don't think anyone can prove that unless it's on camera. No, somewhere. I think no. I think it's actually it was uh, in some side explanation that was perhaps canon back then, but it's been mm. thrown out now. Fair enough. Yeah. But no, I don't think. Um, for all the years that um, I've seen A New Hope, Star Wars as it was called back in the day, mm -hmm. um, it was something that I didn't really pay attention to. No, I, I think it's care. only since the digital age and social media that people have picked it up. I'm not saying that people wouldn't have picked it up back then, but certainly from uh, my viewing experience, it certainly wasn't something I really focused on. No. I didn't actually notice it in my younger years. It, was, it wasn't that important. But I think the explanation's fine. I think um, Chewbacca didn't look that bothered, didn't look uh, put out in any way. I yeah. uh, gave a big roar at the end, actually. Yeah, Maybe that was him saying, where's my effing medal? I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? Well, very much like Harley, Stephen, as you did uh, name drop, uh, my fox red Labrador, he wouldn't care much for a medal. He'd try and eat it. Yeah. And he'd give out a roar and maybe even a bark. Give him a corgo. Yeah, yeah. But look, we're going to end on that note, Stephen. I, actually, I'll throw in this one last final thing, Stephen, before I end. I cared more about Chewbacca not being given a hug or recognition yeah. at the end yeah. of The Force Awakens than I did about him ever. Again, Carrie can't reach him. Carrie can't reach him, yeah, that'd be very strange thinking about it, yeah. yeah. She'd be at the wrong height completely. But we'll end on that note. That does bring us to the end of the show. Did you enjoy this Force Friday show? If you did, comment below, like, subscribe, and we'll be back next Tuesday with Box Office Chat.